So we're going to talk about breaking through. And literally, guys, I know what it feels like to be in a rut. I know what it feels like to feel like this is never going to end. I hate my life. Everything's falling apart. I'll be in that storm right about now. <laughs> Things have been falling apart. I'm like, oh, the person that was helping me ain't helping me. Oh, everything. Oh, more bills. Where did those $200 find? Where did that come from? What $200 deactivation be? Oh, what is it? So I know what it's like when world, the world starts throwing a bunch of stuff on you and you just feel like you can't take it anymore. But see, it goes beyond that because I also know what it feels like to understand that my future is taken care of. See, while everything else is weighing me down and while I'm not sure and I don't know if I really want to believe what I believe sometimes and I struggle and I wrestle with that, you guys, as your youth pastor, I'm going to tell you, I wrestle with God. I have struggles with God too. Why didn't God show up when I prayed for that person? Why didn't God do what his word says he'll do? But the problem is, is we have an enemy, the adversary, the devil, who is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour you, destroy you, demolish you, whatever words you want to use, he wants to obliterate you. He hates your guts. If he could stab you, he would be that guy. So instead, he stabs you in the back through your friends. He stabs you in the back through your family. I know what it feels like. You guys, I know what it feels like to wonder if I'm ever going to break through. And so does this guy. You're like, what guy? This guy. In John chapter 20, verses 24 through 31, there is a disciple named Thomas. Now, Thomas wasn't that little engine that could. <laughs> he wasn't that little engine that believed. He was that little engine that was deceived. He was that little engine that just couldn't, couldn't believe until he saw something happen. So let's read about Thomas. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, that's probably why I didn't understand that, Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Let's just talk about that real quick. Peace be with you. You might need to be calmed down if some dude just shows up in the middle of a locked building. You're just chilling in a locked building, and, and, and somebody like right there in front of you, like, hey, what's up? Hey, whoa. How you get in here? This is all locked. You know, that'd be kind of awkward. You know what I'm saying? Like, yo, dog, how you, you, break, you break my door? How you get in? You pick the lock. I'm going to call the cops. But Jesus has no problem breaking and entering into your life. Ooh, man. Mm -hmm. That's good. I'm going to write that down later. <laughs> Anyways, then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. That is gross. You want me to touch for a spear went through? That's nasty. But I'd probably do it too, just to believe. Stop doubting and believe. Can I tell you something? When God has to come and reveal himself for you to believe in him, you will be rebuked. God doesn't come to reveal himself to you because you don't believe. If you don't believe and he has to reveal himself, you're going to have rebuke in that. It's not going to be like, oh, yay, yeah, he revealed himself, everything's happy. He's like, why don't you believe in the first place? Oh. And what the problem is now, you have no choice but to believe. So when he says that, you're like, No. I should have. And you just hope that's the right answer. So here's what's crazy. He says, stop doubting and believe. So you think, like, this guy would get it, right? He gets it. He goes, oh, Thomas, my Lord and my God. And he's like, oh, light bulb, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> You're Jesus. You did rise from the grave. Then Jesus told him this. He said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miracles, signs, 
in the presence, many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So right there, just go ahead. If you have your Bible, write a little line inside and put like more miracles. <laughs> because he's done more than what's in the Bible. And he's not afraid to do more than what's in the Bible today. Okay. <laughs> Good thing we're recording this. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. God, I just thank you for your word, God. I thank you that it is sharper than a double-edged sword, that it penetrates, God, dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, that it judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. God, I pray right now that your word, which is God-breathed, that it is useful for rebuke, useful for correction, God. Useful for training and equipping us in every matter of righteousness, God. I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts tonight, God. Break through the rock on our heart so that we can see the rock that heals Jesus, our Savior. And say this name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We've seen the Lord. You guys remember that? We've seen the Lord. They're all excited. Some of you guys went down and said some of you were excited. You're like, we've seen the Lord. Woo! And your friends are like, what? What? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean? Uncensored life. Back up. I didn't give up you got. Some of us have had like some crazy revelation recently. Some of us are hungry for the word of God and we're like, yeah, okay, look what I just learned. Blah, 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 texting people. And everybody's like, man, whatever, dog. What? And some people might even be at the skate park going, hey, y'all y'all need to turn to Jesus. Some people might be at the, at the mall going, hey, y'all need to turn to Jesus. What happens, though, is when somebody encounters God, they get excited and they want to go tell people. But why is it that everybody has to bash that? Why? Why is it that when we see the Lord, nobody else seems to know who he is? Am I alone in that? Because I feel like I am sometimes. I feel like my words go forth here every single week. I pour out my heart before you and tell you that what you're trusting in is not going to complete you. It is an idol. Let me tell you about an idol. I had an idol in my life and God removed it. I put all of me into it and I got, and I had less of me left. But see with God, you put all of you into him and he gives you more. You come back even more than you were before. You're like, whoa, that was weird. See, when God calls us to sacrifice something, it's really not a sacrifice. It should be called investment. Because the reimbursement will blow your mind. There's something about this, you guys, that if we really invested our all to God, we would, we would shock ourselves. We would be like, did that just happen? Yes, it did. And then you'd have a friend who could, like, tell a story with you about something that God did. For the people who were here worshiping that night, I went to the back while some of the students were up here worshiping, and I went to the back, and I said, God, I couldn't build this. Because this is my heart. I could worship all night, God. But I didn't even tell them to worship. I had movies that they could watch, but instead they wanted to worship. I believe your generation is looking for an encounter with God. You're looking for transformation, not information. You're tired of people telling you what you need to know, instead of showing you what they know by their life. I had a friend that was telling me all this stuff he was learning and all this craziness, and I'm like, holy cow, dude, whoa, dude. And I realized he was in like seminary school where you learn about God and you read the Bible a lot and you read all these different books. And he was telling me all this stuff. I said, dude, the Bible is not about what you know, it's about what you show. Jesus said, it doesn't matter what you know, do you glow? He says, shine your light before all men that you may glorify your Father in heaven. The people will know you by your love. So you guys, if you want to break through, you got to believe that when somebody says, I've seen the Lord, that they really did see him. That something has really changed in them. you got to believe in that. you got to believe with them. Because if you don't, you tear that down and they walk away thinking that maybe they've been tricked. Maybe somebody has given them the bait and switch program. You guys, there's marketers out there do this thing called bait and switch. They say you're gonna get something, but they give you the totally opposite. So how many of you guys, you have an encounter with God, and then somebody starts negating it, starts saying, I don't know, man, I don't know, God doesn't do that. I don't know, man, watch out, man, watch out. Oh, I don't know, man, that could be a deceiving spirit. And you're like, deceiving spirit? 
I'm freaking blown up with Jesus right now. The Bible says that you cannot say the name of Jesus and in the same instance defend his name. You guys, there's something about the Bible. I talk about 1 Corinthians when we talk about breaking the bread, you know what I'm talking about? And I, and I talk about communion. I actually was sitting in a pastoral meeting the other day. I said, what will happen when God starts showing up like 1 Corinthians says? If you're taking communion and your heart's not right, you could be struck down and killed. Because you imagine if we're having communion on a Sunday morning and somebody's like, my heart's not right. Just lays it done. Oh, snap. Exactly. I would probably be thinking other words, like, I'm out. <laughs> I'm gone. I did not, mm, I didn't cook that. My hand, my fingerprints ain't on that. I ain't killed nobody, because I know for some reason they're gonna come right after me. The devil be like, he did it. God be like, what's up? Hey, don't come after the dude in the t-shirt. Just because I'm not wearing a suit, dog. <laughs> you can't get me. But for real, you guys, what would happen if this generation took God's word seriously? We take text messages from our friends more seriously than God's 66 books of messages to us. You guys realize you can read one verse and it can change your whole life. One verse. One verse can change your whole life if you let it. But how many of us have let it? How many of us have said, God, I'll give your word a chance. You know, in, in the book of Romans, there, there's a part that, that talks about... Um, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation. Half of the guilt you feel every day that you felt like you've done something wrong. I'm not even going off my notes right now, but half of the things you felt like you've done something wrong, you're carrying this weight. I'm ugly. I hate myself. I can't do anything right. Kill me. Kill me. I'll kill myself. And when you start thinking like that, the only way you can knock those thoughts out as if you start replacing that with God's thoughts about you. You guys, the devil tears me down just as much as he tears you down, if not more. Because I'm interceding for you. I believe for you. I see what's in you before you see it. And some of you guys, come, you come in here, I don't want this to be just a youth group where kids come to Christ for a season, and then when they go to college, they fall away. I'm tired of reading statistics like that. I'm tired of seeing people who don't stand on what they say they believe. They're watching you. Your friends are watching you. You say you know God. The devils know God, but they shudder. That's what James says. The, devils know, the devil knows there is a God. But at least he's smart enough to be scared. We defend God and think everything's cool. You guys, we have to be a generation that's willing to break through. Let's not be a Thomas. When other people have seen the Lord, let's believe them and let's be a part of that. And for some of us, unless I see it, I believe it. I know people like that with miracles. With people being healed. I don't believe God can heal until I see it. In case you're going to be waiting for a while, what you mean? You won't see it until you believe it. And the Bible says, do not chase signs and don't chase signs and wonders because they're deceiving signs and wonders. Faith cannot deceive, but signs can. So our flesh like wants to see it to believe it, but our spirit wants us to believe it before we see it. So how many of us, if we're honest, will admit we're like Thomas? All right, God, if I see it, unless I see it, I, I just I don't know, God. Your, your word, your word says you and every cattle on the hill, but uh. I'm having a hard time right now, and finances are bad, so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go steal something. Because, uh, I mean, I, I believe your word. Your word says you take care of me and stuff, but I want it, and uh, because I want it, I'm going to take it. We can't have that. We can't have that mindset. You guys, and I'm not even talking about like material goods. I'm talking about relationship. See, sometimes we want what that other person has to offer, and it's not ours to take. It really is. When we try to mess up somebody on Facebook by talking bad about them, oh, that blankety blank, 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 and everybody's like, oh, they're watching you. And, and you guys, sometimes we, we spend more time doubting than we should be declaring. 
We doubt God. We doubt God's presence. We, just, we, don't, we don't know. We're like, God, God, what do I do? I don't feel you. And blah, 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 blah. And because we, we put so much faith in our doubt, what do we do with that? We have to get back to the state of declaring who God says he is. We have to get back to the place, you guys, where we're willing to break through because we can speak what God's word says. Now, I'm not saying just quote verses and be that guy who's rambling off verses because that gets annoying because people go, don't just quote verses at me. Can I tell you guys something? My life is the loudest and the best sermon I'll ever preach if I follow Christ. It's the most important sermon I'll ever preach the life that I live before you guys. If I fall, some of you guys' faith rests on your leader. If I fall, you go, I guess God's not with me. And you'll walk away. I just pulled almost tipped over. <laughs> but you'll walk away. If your leader falls, he's a hypocrite, so I'm going to go be one too. Doesn't make any sense, you guys. When somebody falls, that should make you more determined to stand. Because you'll build the person, exactly, you'll build the person that fell back up. I know this is heavy. This ain't even weird. But really, guys, this ain't even on my notes. I was following the whole scripture before. But um, as I said, the doors were locked. This was like the most important part to me about the doors being locked. Because Thomas had set himself in a place where he was like, Jesus could be walking around. <laughs> All right, guys, hey, welcome to the house. <laughs> You guys have to understand that. He had already been told that they've seen Jesus. We've seen Jesus. Oh, why were the doors locked? If Jesus wasn't in that place, why were the doors locked? You got it? Okay, the doors locked, good. Why? If Jesus wasn't there when they started, and other people had already said, I've seen him, why were the, why were the doors locked? How many of you guys, if Jesus was honestly walking around in this town or your neighborhood, how many of you guys would be like, I'm not sure who he visits? You know what I'm saying? I would keep a door open. I keep a window open. I keep some little tape player going, Jesus, come to my house. Jesus, come. I can sit out the window the whole time. Jesus, come to my house. Jesus, come to my house. Jesus. Then you have to raise me from the dead because I run out of bread. But I mean, really, guys, how many of us have locked the doors to our heart before Jesus could even show up? Think about that, you guys. It's important. This is the most important thing. If you're not open, you're closed. Man, that sounds like Tyler Megan Knights all over it. If you're not open, you're closed. If you can get that in your head tonight, if I'm not open to God moving, I'm closed and he won't. Oh. Oh. The Bible says draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. It doesn't say God will draw near to you so you draw near to him. Because <laughs> if it wanted to say that, it would have said that. It's really cool, you guys. The Bible is probably the only book you'll read that will always say what it means and mean what it says. Other books, people will write something and be like, oh, dang, that's not quite what I meant. But the Bible's the only one when you read it, you're like, that is good. Hmm, circle that word. Cool. Oh, man. I was reading today in Philippians. I've read Philippians like 20 times. And I was reading in Philippians. And I saw something. And, and Stephen, we had had a few conversations recently. And, and I even, I even told Stephen, I'm like, man, I've been, you know, i got to be careful about how I get because I get passionate, I get crazy, blah, blah, blah. And as I'm reading it, Philippians 2, it's on my outro of my CD. It says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. I'm like, oh, okay, that's cool. Who did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he took on the nature of a servant. Man, I like the first line, you should have the same attitude as Christ Jesus. Oh, no. But then the next line is like, but you should be a servant. Can I tell you guys what a, what a servant is? A servant is the person who will not be noticed for what they're doing. Man, that spoke to my heart. I don't want to be noticed through our youth group. I don't want it to be Pastor Conrad's youth group is the best youth group ever. I want it to be the overflow you church. It's a move of God. And if you want to encounter God, that's where you go. I'm willing to be the voice in the wilderness if 
That's what I have to be. But I want this to be a place where it's known for the students and not known for the pastor. You guys, churches are known all over for the, the mega churches are known by their pastors. But I want this place to be known by students. It's cool if they say, well, they're under Pastor Conrad's leadership. That's okay. I can take that. I mean, the disciples were under Jesus, and Paul even wrote his name in one of his letters and in his letters. So I can take that. But I want you guys to for real make a difference. I want you in your school, people to realize there's something different about you. That you broke through. You broke through the mold of this life. You broke through what everybody else has done. And you found something they need. How many of you guys tonight are confident in saying, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior? It's okay if you don't, but how many of you guys are confident? I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I ain't perfect, but it's not my perfection, it's my direction, and thank you, Lord, for that. Yes. Praise the Lord. I make mistakes too. Now remember, you guys just raise your hand. <laughs> God accepts us as we are, but he doesn't leave us there. It's, it's so important, you guys. God changes us when we exchange our life for his. God can only change you when you lay down your wants for his wants, your desire for his desire. Until you become a living sacrifice before God, he has nothing to set on fire. He has nothing to burn. You are the kindling. You are the, you're the wood. You are what is going to fuel the fire that he wants to bring to Buford. But until you're a living sacrifice and you put yourself on the altar, he can't start the fire that he wants to start. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. As a believer, that statement should line up with us. In, in Galatians chapter 5 also, it says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful nature along with its passions and desires. There are some heavy words in the word, but they're meant to be light for those who are in Christ. It's heavy to those who aren't in Christ. But those who are in Christ, it's light. Because it's like, why would I want to live in the flesh? Why would I want to do that? It's going to hurt me. And knowing that's going to hurt you, God says, look, I'll show you myself. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. God is not afraid. He is not afraid of your unbelief. Understand that. You will be rebuked. <laughs> the rebuke's not bad. It's not always bad. You guys, rebuke is not always like, you're bad. It's not like that. Rebuke is like, I'm going to help you out to get this a little bit better. He's going he's gonna to straighten out your understanding a little bit. And depending on your humility will really depend on how hard he is. But honestly, you guys, you have to go, all right, God, whatever it takes for me to believe, I just want to believe. Right now, I want you to say, God, I want to believe. Help me with my unbelief. I believe that's one of the most powerful prayers in the New Testament. There's a man who came to Jesus, and he says, forgive me for my unbelief. He's like, and Jesus is blown away. Because it's an honest heart. It's an honest heart that needs help. Worship me, come on up. Cheated, huh? After you, after you touch his side, after you, after you have God's presence, if you've been in God's presence, after you've come to Christ and you put your hand in his side and you felt his presence, you're gonna have this revelation of my Lord and my God. I spent so many years chasing what people told me would fill me up. I spent so many years. Lighting up the, the blunt and popping the bottle and hoping that this would cover up everything that just happened. 
See, guys, I have, a, I have a past. We all have a past. We've all turned to the wrong things. We've all put all of us into an idol. What is that idol in your life tonight? If you want to break through, what is that idol? Was that idol in the unbelief that God could really show up and do something? Because that's what Thomas's idol was. Thomas's idol was unbelief. He put more faith in the fact that Jesus didn't rise than believing the people he had been walking with for years when they came to him and said, we saw Jesus. Uh-uh. I can't believe until I see it. And then Jesus, being as loving as he is, he said it like this, because you have seen me, you have believed. Bless those who have not seen and yet believed. We are a generation that might not see God face to face. We might not see Jesus face to face. We might never have a tingly feeling inside or the warm fuzzies and the goosebumps. It might never happen. But we can't let our feelings determine how we go after the Father. We have to be willing, you guys, to believe it before we see it in order to receive it. I'm so tired of seeing how many people are hurt in these schools. You guys, if you could read some of the emails I've gotten, you'd understand why I feel the way I feel up here. Was it not last week that something horrible happened? Because someone didn't believe what was already written about them. Because they believed the lie so much, the lie was so loud that they couldn't hear God's voice. They couldn't hear what was true about them because the lie got too loud. You have to get the distractions out of the way. If you want to break through, you have to say, God, if I'm that guy that will only believe it when I see it, God, I humble myself before you when I say I'm that God. God can help a humble heart. He will exalt you. He will lift you up. In a relationship with the Father, it's not your feelings, it's faith. Faith should not require feelings. But it might acquire them. If you have faith in God in the hard times, the Bible says that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will surround you. You want the peace of God? You want a feeling? The peace that surpasses anything you could explain. If you were to write a book with your best thoughts, it would be garbage compared to the surpassing greatness of that peace. afraid of feelings, but he wants to be worshipped for who he is and not what he gives. The Bible in Mark, the book I just read from, in verse 31, it says why this whole entire book was written. Mark said, this is why I spent the time to put this book together. This is why the Holy Spirit and I felt it was necessary to write this. He wrote, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Life comes from nothing but his name. Remember that, say, life comes from nothing but his name. You ready? Life comes from nothing but his name. Be willing to say that until you believe it. Life comes from nothing in his name. You guys realize I have trusted the wrong things. As your pastor, I have trusted the wrong things for life. But life comes from nothing but his name. It is in his name that our knees bow and our tongue confesses that he is Lord. 
I'm gonna keep singing it. We're gonna keep singing it. I want this to be that song that's rotating in your mind.
But with Jesus, even when the waves rock and the boat is rocking back and forth, and the ship that I'm on feels like it's going to sink, I know that if the boat sinks, I have a promise that says I can walk on water. So I've been praying, God, my man-made boat can sink so that my God I can walk on water. God, give us the faith to please you. Give us the faith to be bold. May we not be a, a generation that just comes to church. May we be a generation that is the church. That we will find life in nothing but your name. That when we worship you, we'll worship you until we're sweating.